Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have uh, Mario Mikhail Krell as our next speaker. He's from the University of Bremen. And he's going to talk about classification environment by space. Thank you. I'm very glad to have the possibility to present our framework here. Um, the framework I will present is a development by the German Research Institute of Artificial Intelligence in Bremen and the robotics group at the University of Bremen. Um, yeah, and PySpace stands for Single Processing and Classification Environment written in Python. So let's start. I will first give a brief introduction or not a brief, a more lengthy introduction, then tell you how the software works, because that's an essential part of the software, then tell you about some concepts and features of the software. Uh, if there is enough time, I will show you some further applications and then give a conclusion. So, PySpace is responsible for the computation of multiple workflows and data sets with applications, for example, in robotics and brain-computer interfaces. Um, it has a simple configuration and it cares for the automatic processing of empirical evaluations, also called benchmarking. It can be applied on feature vector and time series data. Um, the configuration requires no programming, so if you want to integrate or improve, you sure need a programming skills, but for the normal usage, you need no programming skills. Uh, there's some meta language used, uh, which uh, simplifies everything. I will tell you something more about that later on. And the execution of the processing is uh, done in a distributed manner. Um, it has an intuitive structure and documentation, and you can choose from more than 100 signal processing and classification algorithms, and there are additionally uh, interfaces to other libraries. Um, it is a medium-sized framework, so more than 40,000 lines of code. It's currently developed and tested on Mac OS X and on Linux. We are looking forward to have it one day running on Windows, but we yet did not tested it or had someone who was willing to implement it or just um, do the adaptations. Um, the development of the software started six years ago, but it became only open source recently in August 2013. Um, there's a core developer team of three to five people and there are approximately 10 developers in total, but developer means mainly uh, people who are integrating their algorithms to later on test them. Um, so it's open source software under GPL. It's available on GitHub. And the documentation is also available on GitHub. So uh, I will tell you a bit about the applications and somehow the motivation why we had to develop such a framework. Um, we had a project called VIBot and the project was about um, virtual immersion and uh, control of a robot. So we have a um, person who is controlling a robot and is having an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is used to directly map the movements intuitively of the user um, to the robot. The robot is in the small picture here. Um, and there's a, a virtual immersion where you uh, can display additional information to the user for example, some warnings, and where we jumped in was um, that we also recorded a brain signal, so EG, you can see the cap there, which is the guy wearing, and um, it was not to control the robot, because a person can much better control a robot, but it was there to um, analyze the person and detect um, how, how we will behave and if he's got certain information in the interface and to improve the interface with the signal. That was the overall goal of the project. Um, where we also used uh, the software was for the evaluation and comparison of sensor selection algorithms and for the comparison and development of dimensionality reduction algorithms and also for the comparison and development of class classifiers. Um, we also, as already said, use it for brain-computer interfaces, so we could predict upcoming movements 
we could uh, detect interaction errors. That means if the interface is not behaving as expected, there's a certain brain signal associated with that. And that could be detected, and we could also detect if the person uh, perceived a warning. So if we show a warning, not read everything, but just some smooth warning, but we want to know if he got this uh, message, uh, we could detect that. And furthermore, there were some robotic applications where the software is used, so for cell detection, parallelization of robot simulations, to tune some localization algorithms and for sensor regression. Um, yeah, some more details at the end if there's enough time. So um, how does the software work? I will first tell you a bit about the installation procedure, then how does the data needs to be prepared, then the most important part, uh, how we define your processing file, and yeah, then how you get it running. Um, so the required dependencies are Python 2.7 or Python 2.6. Um, you need the YAML package, uh, you need NumPy and SciPy. And there are some op uh, optional dependencies because it depends on what you algorithms you want to use uh, in your processing. So you might need matplotlib for visualizations, scikit-learn if you want to have an extended access to further classifiers and transformations. Um, you might need PyQt if you want to use some GUIs. Um, VKR, Maya Machine Learning Framework, LibSVM, LibLinear. Modular tool for, for data processing or CVX opt for some um, special classifiers and some more. So um, when you want to install, you just have to download it, install the uh, required dependencies and run a little script uh, which cares for the configuration on your PC such that you just have to start the software. There's nothing more to be done. Um, for the data, um, it's normally just on the file disk and um, what we can access is feature vector data from comma separated value files or ARFF files. ARFF files are the typical files for the Vika framework. Um, you can have time series segments and comma separated value files and also process time series streams um, specified in comma separated value files or in the EDF2 format or some EG specific formats. Um, for the data preparation, you have to tell the framework how to um, access to the data. So specify the um, storage format. Um, here we have a comma separated file, value file without uh, any heading. You have to tell which type of data it is expecting, so if it's feature vector or time series data. Um, you might also tell uh, the software which of the existing files is the relevant one, and most importantly, for classification, you need to tell the framework where does it find the labels of the data in that file. That's all for the data. Now the most important part, um, how do we specify the processing? Um, First of all, so I will step by step go to through that file because that's our main work when we are uh, testing algorithms, just specifying these files. And if my colleague is asking me, well, how did you do that processing? I just sent him the file and he knows everything. Um, yeah, that's how it works. Uh, so we first uh, define the type of processing. There are different types of how you can process. So just some operations on data sets and no chain means that you are have a concatenation of algorithms which you apply on your data, uh, sample by sample mostly. So then you tell them where's the, where it can find the data. Um, you have something like repetitions, so if you have some randomization in your processing, uh, as you have it in the libsvm or if you're splitting your data randomly, um, it's good to always have repetitions to um, account for the randomness. and that's done with that simple number. It's just telling, just repeat everything three times. Um, now the most important part is the node chain. So it begins with a node with, which is just accessing the data and forwarding it. Then we split the data. So that's just an example. There's much more you can choose, but 
just for that example, you can uh, split your data, 40% um, training, the rest is used for testing, it's randomly split, and then you can train a, a normalization node, so um, it means that your data is normalized, so you can, for example, um, normalize the data to have zero mean and uh, variance of one, that would be the Gaussian feature normalization, or you can normalize the data vectors or feature vectors to have norm one, that would be a Euclidean feature normalization and there's much more. And this uh, tag here is just a placeholder for the algorithm later on. Um, then you can have a support vector machine, here we use the standard libSVM support vector machine, it's just an interface to that classifier and you can specify the most important parameter of that classifier, the uh, complexity. Um, and finally, there's um, just a node which calculates all the performance metrics which you might be interested on that data. Um, so for the parameters, we have the possibility to use different numbers for the complexity here. So three different numbers and uh, two algorithms. And um, what the framework does, it's using all combinations of the different param parameters which you spe specify and runs th this uh, node chain with each specification three times. Um, there's also a possibility to specify a, a lot more parameters and have some more complex chains, but that's so far, I think, enough. So um, finally, you might want to modify your configuration of the software, although that's normally done by default and everything is fine. So we have a folder where you uh, say where the data can be found. You have a directory where you can um, tell him the software where it finds his um, specifications for the processing. You have some um, logging um, settings and you can furthermore modify your Python parse. Um, if you want to include special libraries, for example, here we used a modified implementation of the libSVM. And then you start the software, and starting the software is just that line. So um, it's the script which uh, cares for the most parts. You tell the software where to find the configuration file, and uh, the last part, tells the software which parallelization mode you want to use. Because if you want to compare algorithms and have repetitions, you run very uh, fast into problems with your processing because just doing it in a serial mode will last years. Um, so um, we also have that mode, it's called single serial, where you can have one execution of a process after the other but we can also use a, a multi-processing package on the PC. And we also have the possibility to use the software on a cluster with a scheduler called load leveler. Um, and we implemented the backend for using it on that cluster because we are several users and it would just, we would just run into problems if we would not use a scheduler. Um, there's also the possibility to use no scheduling with an MPI backend, and there's also the possibility to add further backends for parallelization. For example, cloud or implement a Gearman um, backend. Um, that's the parallelization which you can uh, set, but there's also some parallelization in the framework under the hood. So um, the creation of jobs is done in parallel during the ex execution of the jobs, and you can also parallelize specific subtasks. For example, if you have internally parameter optimization, um, it needs some additional evaluations that can be done also in parallel. And also when you're going to the application, you might want to run different processing chains even on the same data, and that can be also done in parallel. So the general structure is um, oriented on the, mainly oriented on the data. So um, we have a summary, which is just uh, a folder which contains several data sets. And the data set, in our definition, is just a summary of different uh, samples, so feature vectors. Um, and normally, we are pr uh, processing a lot of data sets in parallel. 
Um, so an operation on the data, uh, an operation is something which works on the data set and it can be concatenated so you can modify your data, um, merge certain data sets, apply a Vika um, operation on it or as already said, you can apply a node chain on that. And the node chain is for us the most important part, especially for the application. Um, it's just a concatenation of nodes and nodes is just some, uh, just an elemental algorithm which is working on the single samples. And for the nodes, there are numerous uh, algorithms available to process the data. So fear filters, sublab sampling, support vector machines, feature normalization, feature generation, um, nearly everything we need. So um, how does it work? We have different data sets, our specification file, and then the software cares for the parallelization and uh, computes the different uh, processing chains uh, which we specified. And finally, you get some column chart, some line chart, or just the process data, or the most important part is uh, some performance table for us to look at the performance values. Um, and the modularity concept uh, of the nodes uh, is something which we did not invent it by our own, but it was uh, stolen from the modular toolkit for data processing. It's important to mention. And um, for the algorithms which we implemented, um, there's, um, so, so we cared for the complete processing chain, which we needed, so we, um, when we have our time series signal, we normally begin with some pre-processing, so we, we have data which is with five kilohertz, so we need some uh, downsampling and some additional uh, time filtering. Um, there's also some spatial filtering. That's something special for EEG. Uh, you just have to think of it as a dimensionality reduction algorithm applied on the dim dimension of sensors. Um, and there's, there's some feature generator, generators, numerous classification algorithms, and as you can also already see, there are wrappers to existing libraries like the scikit-learn algorithms or the liblinear um, framework or the Lib SVM classifiers. Um, I have some post-processing for feature normalization or um, mapping scores, visualization of data, and maybe the meta nodes are also something very important because you can include in a meta node a subchain or uh, you can optimize your parameters in there internally in a node. Yeah, and source and sync nodes for loading and storing the data. Yeah, and when we implement and invent new algorithms, we just integrate it there and have immediately the possibility to compare it with existing algorithms and also with the algorithms developed by colleagues. So for the package structure, we have an environment package where we have the backends for the parallelization, some um, implementations for the node and operation chains, so how to concatenate these types of algorithms, some application interface and the configuration interface. For them, we have some something called missions where we implement the nodes, which are these parts which I already show, and some operations which are working on the complete data sets and something more. Yeah, we have our data descriptions, some scripts. Um, we also have a GUI, but we mainly work with that configuration and the command line uh, part, especially when we're working on a cluster. That's how it works best. Um, we have numerous tests and uh, some additional tools. Um, for the documentation, as I already said, it's on GitHub. It's internally in our institute generated on a daily basis to immediately find out if there's something wrong, at least in the documentation. Um, it, it's based on Sphinx, and uh, here I want to ask uh, who does not know Sphinx? Oh, that's good, very good. <laughs> Okay, um, we did some modification on Sphinx to improve our API documentation and have it customized as we want because, yeah, it was not as we wanted to, but it's really, really cool because it's, there's a possibility to use, do many, many things automatically and kind of tune your documentation and that's what we did a lot. So. We have a mapping between class names and the node algorithm names, so that you can have some short names instead of maybe long class names. Um, 
that's already displayed automatically in the documentation. It's also displayed which input is possible for the different nodes. Um, some examples which are included in the documentation are automatically um, generated and we have a list of all available algorithms and that's completely generated automatically. Yeah. For the uh, testing, we normally do not touch the core functionalities such often. Um, but if we touch it, we are doing multiple checks. Um, um, there are unit tests which we run on a daily basis um, and I always get some emails where I check if everything is still going right. I have regular user fees, feedback and recently we implemented generic unit tests uh, for all our nodes because testing the nodes is the most important part. Um, so it's first testing if there's some documentation of the node, um, if there's an exemplary call existing such that you know at least a little bit how to use that node. Um, if that exemplary call is really working and then um, the node is generated and applied to some testing data and it is tested if it really works. And there's also the possibility to modify that test such that it's more easy to implement your own real unit test because that's just a generic test and for unit testing you might need some more testing. Yeah, and there are scripts for running both types of tests. So, um, coming to further applications. So, uh, what you can see here is um, some uh, robot control scenario. And first, we do all our optimization of the processing uh, with PySpace, and then we have to think about how to transfer it to the application. And that's also in, inside of the framework, so we have a script called uh, launch live, which is cares for all the um, parts which are needed for the processing, and so we can um, immediately um, apply that processing in our application. For example, here the robot control scenario, and as you can see here, there's some warning displayed, and we can detect if that person not just saw that. Um, warning because seeing could be done with some eye tracker but we can detect if he really got the message and realize that it's important. Um, for the um, how does it work? So we have our normal benchmarking application where we store finally the data and for the live application we just process the single samples and finally stream it to the uh, application where it is needed. Um, it's also configured by YAML, and yeah, the, if we normal, we normally process different parts of the signal, and so we um, need multiple processing flows, which are executed in parallel. Um, maybe come back to that. What you can see is um, when you have that EEG cap on, it's quite problematic. You do not want to also have be connected to a PC. PC. You want to have the possibility to go there independently, especially if you think of the uh, graphics at the beginning with the exoskeleton. It's, you want to move freely in your environment, and so um, you need to transfer the processing on a mobile device. And um, a mobile you need a mobile device which hopefully does not require so much uh, energy. And um, that approach is called Respace. Re so, reconfigurable uh, PySpace. Um, what we do in our application is that we leave the acquisition of the data in PySpace, but then the pre-processing is done in a hardware accelerator processing on an FPGA. And that's quite important because something like DC removal and decimation and subsampling and all that part um, really requires a lot of processing power and um, even if you implement it in C, uh, it's still a lot, and so on an FPGA, it's done extremely fast. Um, then we uh, cut our relevant parts of the signal, and then we do the post-processing, so some dimensionality reduction, feature extraction, feature normalization, classification and modification of the threshold, and finally, send the uh, result via PySpace to the 
um, interface which needs the singer and is further on using it, yeah. Um, for the processing, we developed a device, a quite small device, 10 centimeters times 7 centimeters, where we do all the processing for the application and where we also target on doing the training uh, of the application. Or, yeah. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, we have enough time. So um, something where our framework was also very, very useful was uh, we had a evaluation on sensor selection algorithms. So if you have EEG, you're using 64 channels or, or sensors and um, sometimes even 128 sensors. And there's always the question, is there a possibility to reduce the number of sensors, especially for the application, it's important to really set up the cap fast because needing half an hour for setting up a cap is not that com comfortable. So not so, yeah, nice. Um, so we um, integrated a lot of algorithms, also um, some algorithms which again just interfaced already existing parts in the software and had the possibility to compare numerous algorithms um, and also uh, for the gray spots, it means uh, the comparison to random selection of sensors. So that was our baseline to have um, some random selection. So we had 100 um, random selections for these caps and processed it and several data sets for processing. So it was really, really a lot and a lot of parameters and some internal optimizations and so on and doing that just in a serial way would have not been possible and would have needed years. Um, yeah, and finally we could see that there's some special algorithm which was quite good for reducing the number of channels and we could use uh, 40 sensors without losing any performance. Um, what we also, it's something which we are currently working on. It's not yet uh, public. We are also working on process, uh, on visualizing the processing of our data. So if you're concatenating your algorithms, you sometimes want to know what is really done with the data. And you might get the classifier weights and see, well, it used that feature and that feature, but then you don't know, well, how that's it how did I get the feature and what is the relation to my original data? And since we have in our framework all the access to the uh, separate algorithms, we can also somehow um, integrate uh, the question on how does the uh, concatenation of algorithms works. And here I have a visualization um, on an extremely simple problem which is already solved and all, but uh, it's the best problem, I guess, for understanding. It's uh, some classification on the MNIST data set, just distinction of number zero and one. Um, and the processing chain was also not that complicated. I just did a PCA um, with uh, using only 40 remaining components. Then I had some feature normalization, and then finally a support vector machine for classification. I know it's not complicated, but it's uh, just for uh, the purpose of showing how it uh, works or what you can see. So um, I asked, so, so the question was, when I have my original data, which are the weights assigned to the single components in the data, which finally result in the classification result? And what you can see here, the red, color is uh, the part for uh, for the positive class, the number one, which uh, where the average shape is displayed here with a white line. And the blue color is, uh, there are the important weights for the um, negative class, which is a zero with this obvious shape here. And the green color is uh, for all that parts which are not relevant for the classification. So um, I guess that's quite helpful. Although one has to admit that it's just showing the um, classification weights and classification weights do not always tell something about the data or are sometimes difficult to interpret. So uh, to conclude, um, PySpace is a framework 
which optimizes a single processing and classification workflow. Um, it's do, doing that automatically and in parallel, and it's also possible to have other evaluations like robot simulations or um, evaluations using the Vika framework. It has an intuitive configuration without any scripting, um, so it's usable by non-programmers, and there's a possibility to integrate other algorithms and libraries. So future steps for us will be to integrate more algorithms and also interface other libraries um, to extend the number of possible data types, for example, pictures, videos, or multimodal data, for example, combine EG data with muscle data and eye data and so on. Um, also, think about further applications, so have some more support for clustering or regression. And we are also hoping for someday have an installation suite, although the installation is not complex. You just have mainly to care for the dependencies and then download the software, and that's the main part. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mario, for the very nice uh, overview of a very practical application using Python. So now we have, uh, we are open for questions. Um, so I'm curious, you said you use uh, Weka. Um, how do you interface to Weka from Python? Um, it's a quite simple interface. It's mainly using a command line command. So the operation is telling Vika where to find the files and is preparing the files and just telling Vika, I want to have that operation with that parameterization. Just run it. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, Bytespace looks like a really interesting uh, library. Um, I've seen other libraries in, in Python do configuration of, of machine learning models via YAML files. There's PyLearn2, for instance, that does that. I was wondering how, in your experience, this scales up to very complex pipelines, because in my experience, uh, if you're programming models in YAML, because that's what you're doing, you're just not doing it in Python, you're doing it in YAML, uh, it gets quite hairy after a while, and after a couple of months, you get back to your model in YAML, it's like, what? It's a big, big, big text file with many, 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 many things. So in your experience, uh, maybe, you know, for PySpace, how does this scale up to complex pipelines? So uh, the algorithms are really implemented in uh, PySpace, but the single algorithms, I think you mean the combination might get uh, quite complex. So if you... Yeah. But it's, it's not just, it's not really programming in YAML, it's just telling, the per, it's just giving the parameters um, um, to the processing. But what is important, um, we also realize that you might want to have some more complex parts, for example, uh, test um, some values from zero to 100, or as I uh, showed in the um, configuration of the uh, sensor selection, have the numbers from 64 to one tested, and you do not want to just enter every single number. You, you can do that by copy and paste and so on. And there's several other parts where you would like to have some computation in your configuration file, and that's not easy, but um, we integrated that. So we do not really use the, um, um, the, basic, the YAML as it was originally um, developed, but we added some functionality to have some Python code in there if you want to specify very complex parts. So for example, if you have a, want to have some evaluation, so um, having, um, for example, some logarithmic scaling for your complexity. You just say 10 to the power of your complexity and the only modification is you put an evil before and the software checks if that keyword is there and then uh, evaluates the expression. It's not easy to integrate that in YAML, but after six years, I think we did it finally. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Um... In your uh, classification and regression, when you use them, um, how do you avoid the uh, circularity in the preprocessing? Like, 
normalization and supervised feature selection methods. Circularity. What um, do you mean with it? When you use, um, you cannot, you know, you cannot use uh, information from the test data to. Ah, okay. So, so uh, mixing testing and training data and so yes. on. Yes. How do yeah. you how do you deal with that in the in your preprocessing nodes? So, um, if the user really wants to mix training and testing data and is doing it on purpose, we cannot avoid it. Okay. But by default, the framework is totally and completely separating training and testing data, and even in the preprocessing. Um, for the preprocessing, everything is assumed to be uh, testing data most of the time, and you really have to specify what is the training data. And um, normally, we have complete separate processing of the training data, training and the testing data, so it's okay. treated as completely separate. You can also specify that in your normal data. So if you have the MNIST data, that's already specified, which is training and testing data. But um, we first use the, only the training data to give it to the algorithms and train it. And f later on, we give the testing data, but we skip the labels. So in the normal data execution, the labels and the uh, data are completely separated. So you have normally no access to it. You can che always cheat, but uh, that yeah. must be done on really okay. on purpose and, and so it's how do you quite do difficult. So how do you do normalization, for example? We, how do you normalize the data before feeding it to the classifiers? So uh, there are several algorithms for doing the feature normalization. Yeah. Um, if you have something like just normalizing the vectors to the norm of one, you do not need any training. Um, but if you want to have something like map the data to a certain interval, um, you have to specify beforehand what is your training data and what is your testing data. Yeah. Otherwise, the software crashes and tells you, well, I did not get any. So you cannot do cross-validation in one We step. can. We can, but uh, that's something you have to specify beforehand. Okay. So you have to tell. Um, so um, when we have that processing chain here, um, uh, there where we have the train test splitter, you can also uh, just integrate a CV splitter, tell the uh, node how many splits to use, and then it's splitting the data and doing everything okay. automatically. And also in the evaluation, you have different performance values for the different splits, and it's completely t t uh, treated separately. And uh, what's maybe important for the cross-validation, um, between the processing of the splits, the node chain is completely reset. So, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, any, any further questions? Thanks for the presentation. Can you handle data streams also, or just offline data sets? Um, for the application, we need to process data streams. So um, it, it's always a question if it's possible to interface it. We have um, some different types implemented for accessing data streams. It's possible. It's yeah. But normally, uh, you might later on want to separate this data stream according to certain signals in this uh, part, but um, for example, for the, if we want to predict the movement, we are really processing the complete stream. So every 50 milliseconds, I think, we are processing um, the data, um, having at the beginning just taking the complete stream, then later on um, calculating some windows, but still in a um, stream manner, and then processing it and just giving a re Apply every 50 milliseconds. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I have a question regarding the signal processing. Uh, so you uh, so you use a, a particular hardware to detect uh, signals from the neurons, huh? uh, from the brains, yeah. yeah. And uh, how how is how does it work in the field? I mean, these are usually very sensitive to interference from other devices. So when you do you use some sort of uh, cleaning method to to cancel out the noise and things like that? I mean, is that a problem? Um, we also test methods on that. So we have had a guy who was implementing artifact removal 
parts, for example, to uh, delete the um, um, eye artifact parts just to be sure that we are focusing on the brain signal and not on the eye signal, and that's done. And we also do uh, sometimes evaluations where we uh, check if we um, remove certain artifacts by hand and then do the classification. Is it still working or is it worse so that we know are we relying on artifacts and also that uh, visualization part which we started or nearly finished um, is part of that just to find out are we really looking at the right signal and um, yeah is is it just looking on artifacts but another important part is what we realized is that due to our filtering normally the artifacts are just removed automatically and we do not have to care interesting thanks uh any any further questions from the audience? Okay, if that's not the case, let's thank our speaker once more.